Good morning, everyone from St. Bart's in Midtown Manhattan, and apologies for the delay in getting started this morning. We had some te technical difficulties that we had to work out, but um, we are here now with you and um, delighted to be uh, joining you this morning. My name is Meredith Ward, and I'm the Associate Rector for Pastoral Care here. And while our vicar, the Reverend Peter Thompson, is taking a few days of well-deserved vacation, I'm delighted to fill in for him this morning as your host and presenter at this morning's forum, where each week we explore important issues at the intersection of faith and the modern world. This morning, we're going to explore the ways in which ideas about art, faith, and science influenced American painting in the mid-19th century, and how those paintings in turn influenced the way Americans understood their relationship with God and nature. We'll take a look at a few key examples of landscape painting and see how faith and science, particularly the field of geology, had an enormous influence on the way American art was created and understood. Hopefully, this look back at our history will help us to better understand our world today as we navigate the apparent divide between faith and science in our own day. So now I'm going to uh, share uh, my slideshow with you. So during the 19th century, American artists were charged with a mission, a mission to not only provide aesthetic enjoyment, but to educate and morally elevate the art viewing public. And since in this largely Protestant Christian country, overt religious imagery was frowned upon as being too Catholic, artists turned instead to the natural landscape to create scenes that could be studied for their scientific accuracy, reflected upon for moral uplift, and contemplated for signs of God's benevolent activity in the world. These were the artists that have come to be known as the Hudson River School. They were landscape painters who were active from roughly about 1825 to roughly about 1870 or 75. And the Hudson River School wasn't actually a formal school or a formal group but they came to be known that way because the center of much of their activity was the area around the Hudson River and the Catskill Mountains. Although, as we shall see, they traveled much farther afield. So this morning's talk is titled Picturing Creation because these artists believed that in painting the American wilderness, they were, in the words of the Swiss scientist Louis Agassiz, revealing the thoughts of the creator, putting before the public eye a sense of the grandeur and awesomeness of God's creation and doing it in a way that had scientific validity. So in April of 1859, here in New York City at the Lyric Hall and Lower Broadway, the American landscape painter Frederick Edwin Church unveiled what would come to be considered one of his greatest masterpieces, the heart of the Andes. The painting was the result of several years of work that included two trips to South America and hundreds and hundreds of preparatory sketches. The final painting was massive, measuring six by 10 feet, and Church installed it in a darkened room with an elaborately carved frame, dramatically lit by gas jets concealed behind silver reflectors. The heart of the Andes was an immediate sensation and quickly became a must-see destination for New York society. Between 12 and 13,000 people filed past it each month. The exhibition of the Heart of the Andes was a culminating moment for church in a year that turned out to be a watershed year, not only for American art, but for science, faith, and the future of the nation. 
Church was one of the foremost members of the Hudson River School, and it's a group that also included his teacher, Thomas Cole, who you are seeing here with one of his best known landscapes. And it also included an artist named William Stanley Hazeltine, who we'll hear a little bit more about later. An important part of the training for each of these artists was the study of geology, which by the 1830s and 1840s had become an essential preparation for landscape painters. This gave their works the imprimatur of accuracy through the careful observation of nature, and it also imbued them with moral significance. In the first half of the 19th century, the study of the natural world was linked to understanding the divine. Students studied science not to understand the natural workings of the world, but to reveal the perfections and sovereignty of God. This view was epitomized by Louis Agassiz's statement, in a word, all these facts in their natural connection proclaim aloud the one God. Now, while there were some geologists who were interested in empirical data, most were focused on geology as a form of moral uplift, patriotism, and revealed religion, including finding geological evidence of the biblical flood. Flood geology found such evidence in the piles of unsorted rock, sand, and gravel, which they termed diluvial drift, as well as erratic boulders. Now, while these phenomena are now understood to be the result of glacial actions of the past, in the early 19th century, they provided evidence of the biblical history. Thomas Cole, who was considered the founder of the Hudson River School, was church's teacher and in, he included these geological phenomena in his paintings, including history paintings like his monumental course of empire, where the erratic, and you can see it here in the distance on top of that mountain, and reappearing in all uh, five versions uh, in this series of paintings, the erratic appears here and here and here and here as an ancient and eternal geologic feature, even as empires rise and fall. And here is the final version of the course, final painting in the series, Course of Empire, where you can again see that erratic still lasting there on the mountaintop. Cole even painted his own vision of the deluge, tracing a path through the dark grotto from chaos to rebirth. In paintings like these, Cole used his understanding of geology to great allegorical effect, directing the viewer to the contemplation of God and the biblical past. And as church's teacher, he would have instilled these ideas in his students. This was the cultural context in which church was trained, a culture that sought to harmonize scientific discoveries and religious beliefs. As a young man, church found a kindred spirit for these ideas in the great German naturalist Alexander von Humboldt, whose multi-volume publication Cosmos became one of the most influential books for American art, science and culture in the 19th century. Humboldt published the first volume of his monumental work in April, 1845, and the impact of the book on the United States was immediate. Humboldt had developed over the course of his life, a revolutionary theory that he called the unity of nature, which held that all parts of the planet from the outer atmosphere to the ocean floor were interconnected. With the publication of Cosmos, Humboldt intended to describe nature as, quote, a unity 
in diversity of phenomena, a harmony blending together all created things. However dissimilar in form and attributes, one great whole animated by the breath of life. Humboldt found inspiration not in Europe, but through his travels throughout North and South America. His work shaped some of the great scientific minds of the 19th century, and it directly influenced the young Frederick Church, who eagerly took up Humboldt's call to artists to see the world as a scientist, observant of nature and its processes, so that he could invest his works with scientific truth as well as aesthetic merit. No artist was more profoundly impacted by Humboldt's theories and writings than Church, and no artist was better equipped to fulfill his vision. Church was a skilled draftsman and careful observer of nature. He owned a copy of Cosmos, which he read and studied, as well as Humboldt's travel narratives, and he absorbed Humboldt's ethos that the artist should see the world as a scientist and studied the physical scientists, sciences. So take a look at Humboldt's Naturgemälde, also known as the Chimborazo map, which is his depiction of the volcanoes Chimborazo and Cotopaxi in cross section with detailed information about plant geography. The illustration was published in the Geography of Plants in 1807, and this and other observational drawings by Humboldt influenced Church's compositional choices when it came time to create his own paintings. Following in Humboldt's footsteps, Church took trips to South America in 1853 and 1857, producing many on-the-spot sketches as Humboldt had counseled Colored sketches taken directly from nature are the only means by which the artist on his return may reproduce the character of distant regions in the more elaborately finished pictures. And this object will be the more fully attained where the painter has at the same time drawn or painted directly from nature, a large number of separate studies of the foliage of trees or leafy flowers or fruit bearing stems of prostrate trunks. And Church took Humboldt's advice to landscape painters to heart. A distinction must be made in landscape painting as in every other branch of art between the elements generated by the more limited field of contemplation and direct observation and those which spring from the boundless depth of feeling and from the force of idealizing mental power. Church intended the heart of the Andes to be his ultimate response to Humboldt's call, incorporating a lifetime of knowledge and experience to create a vision of a single unified natural world in a single unified work, a work that displayed accuracy through direct on-site observation and conveyed the grandeur of the natural world to elicit feelings of spiritual and moral inspiration. Indeed, the final painting was not a literal depiction, but a composite of the various scenes in order to achieve the greatest dramatic, and effect, dramatic effect and emotional impact. Humboldt, who was a product of enlightenment thinking, avoided any direct reference to God or religion in his scientific writings. However, Church, who was raised in a conservative congregational church in Hartford, Connecticut, and who remained a devout Christian all his life, found that Humboldt's conception of harmony and unity in nature fit well within his own Protestant faith, his belief in a providential God, and his biblical understanding of creation. Church and many of his contemporaries were rooted in an American Protestantism that, as historian Herbert Hovenkamp has argued, devised a scientific theology that could prove anything. In this so-called scientific theology, the observation of nature 
could be used to better understand God and to find proof of God's existence. Indeed, when Heart of the Andes was put on view, commentaries on the painting were able to hold science and faith in easy coexistence, confident in the assurance that this unified and harmonious natural world provides proof of God's providential plan. Almost immediately, members of the clergy published pamphlets, wrote articles, and even preached sermons extolling the beauty, grandeur, and moral uplift of church's masterpiece. One critic wrote that, quote, the deep meaning of nature, its purity, elevating influences are profoundly felt in the presence of this truly religious work of art. Henry Ward Beecher, the liberal Congregationalist preacher, pastor of Brooklyn's Plymouth Church, abolitionist and social reformer, reportedly declared that it was a sin for any man in the country to miss seeing Church's Heart of the Andes when it could be inspected for 25 cents. Thomas Cole's pastor, the Reverend Louis Legrand Noble, published a 43-page pamphlet that walked viewers through the painting, essentially taking them on a pilgrimage journey, starting from the foreground in the lower left, up through the higher elevations, and eventually to the snow-capped peak in the distance. And here you have a couple of details of the lower left foreground and central foreground. Noble wrote evidently some apprehension of the process of landscape painting, landscape making by the instrumentalities of the creator is necessary in order to successfully conduct the process of landscape painting by the feeble instrumentalities of man. He continued the light, the spaces, the atmosphere, linking all confusion into order, blending all parts, running up an infinity of things living into one living organic whole and leading the mind into the presence of the maker. Church had hoped to put the painting before Humboldt and was in the process of arranging to have it sent to Berlin, but Humboldt had died in May, 1859, just a few days after the painting was unveiled in New York. What Church could not have known is that his painting would be the artistic apotheosis of this grand design view of the natural world. The idea of God's providential hand in the natural world and the biblical story of creation had already started to come into question through the discovery of fossils and the growth of the field of geology. I'm showing you here some pages from what is known as the Baskerville Bible printed in 1763. And this is a Bible that happens to be owned by St. Bart's parishioners, Jamie and Flora Ferrara. So thank you to Jamie and Flora for allowing me to use these images. You'll notice that it dates the creation of the universe, Genesis chapter one, at the year 4004 BC. This date had been carefully calculated in the 17th century by the Anglican Archbishop of Ireland, James Usher, through a literal reading of the Bible and synthesizing all of the known historical knowledge of that age. But geologists and other scientists were beginning to discover that the earth was not a mere 4,000 years old, but was more likely billions of years old. And through the same observation of nature that had been used to better understand God, more was being discovered that made the biblical history less convincing. So that by the middle of the 19th century, it was becoming increasingly difficult to reconcile Holy Scripture with new scientific discoveries in biology and geology. Then, just seven months after Church unveiled his masterpiece, and six months after Humboldt died in Berlin, in November of 1859, 
Charles Darwin published his On the Origin of Species, which introduced the idea of evolution and natural selection. With his groundbreaking work, Darwin, who had been a student of Humboldt, smashed many of the central points of Humboldt's vision, arguing that nature was not a place of unity and harmony, but a place of struggle and competition, that evolutionary lines do not intrinsically move toward higher states of being, but are merely opportunistic adaptations to the local environment, and that these changes are not propelled by any internal or harmonious force, but are completely random. For people accustomed to a harmonized understanding of creation governed by the beneficent and providential hand of God, this was a shocking and earth shattering revelation. And of course, Darwin's theory changed the course of science forever. We don't know how Church felt about the origin of species. We know that he held many scientific volumes in his library, including works by Humboldt, but he did not own any book by Darwin. Church lived until 1900, but by the end of the 1860s, his years of painting great landscapes were behind him. And there may be many reasons why this may be so, including a catastrophic civil war, Church's ill health, changing fashions, but we may well wonder if Darwin's revolutionary ideas made it impossible to conceive of such a harmonized vision of the natural world and crushed Church's ambition to ever again produce such a monumental picture of abundant, diverse, and unified creation. One of Darwin's fiercest critics in the scientific world was the Swiss scientist Louis Agassiz. Like many of his contemporaries, Agassiz believed that the goal of science was to discover the inner workings of nature and to uncover proofs of a benevolent God. As he wrote, a God infinitely wise is regulating nature according to immutable laws, which he himself has imposed on her. Agassiz, who had been a student of Humboldt, believed that this combination of time and space and all the thoughtful conceptions exhibits not only thoughts, it shows premeditation, power, wisdom, greatness, prescience, omniscience, providence. In one word, all these facts proclaim aloud the one God. In 1860, Agassiz responded to Darwin's theories in a series of lectures given at the Museum of Comparative Zoology at Harvard University, where Agassiz was teaching. In these lectures, he explained his own theory of the sequential appearance of animal groups when he stated, my opinion is most decidedly that all animals are the result of the plan of a creative being. But Agassiz's greater contribution to the natural sciences was his study of glaciers, which he published in 1840, which, in which he showed that it was not the biblical flood that had moved rocks around the face of the planet, but it was an ice age that moved these large erratics and boulders. Now his theories were not entirely accurate, but they were accurate enough to put to rest the, the idea that the biblical flood was the force that moved rocks around the planets and uh, the planet. And one of the places that Agassiz found evidence for his theory was at Nahant, Massachusetts, where the topography of the coast revealed the marks of Agassiz's ancient ice sheets. This is a painting by the American landscape artist, William Stanley Hazeltine, who attended Harvard and may have studied with Agassiz when he was at the peak of his popularity. And if so, it would be significant because Nahant was the place where Agassiz took his students to show them the effects of glacial action. Like Church, Hazeltine saw the connection between art and science. And he said years later that every real artist is also a scientist and an artist is not satisfied until his work is a true expression of what he feels to be real. By about 1865, however, the public fascination with rocks was starting to fade. 
and Agassiz's theories were gradually being tripped away. One critic observed, I cannot find, as Hazeltine appears to, a square foot after square foot of bare, smooth, clean, cleft, swept, and garnished rock. Let Agassiz come and straight away a new world opens, new truths appear, but plain to be seen are many things which the half looker never sees. Like Church, Hazeltine lived until 1900, and we don't know how he felt about Darwin's theories, but by the 1870s, he had joined a group of American artists in Rome, eventually settling there permanently. Of Hazeltine's religious convictions, we know that he was a devout Episcopalian and for 30 years served on the vestry and as warden of St. Paul's Within the Walls in Rome. As we examine this history, we know that these same debates about faith and science are alive and well today. Are faith and science truly at odds with each other? How do we respond to this debate? Do scientific discoveries necessarily contradict our ideas of a benevolent creator God? Are faith and science really at war? The English biologist Thomas Huxley made an attempt to respond to this question in April of 1859, just as Church's great painting was going on view when he advised, if you have seen occasion to put any faith in what I tell you, believe me now when I say that of all the miserable superstitions which have ever tended to vex and enslave mankind, this notion of the antagonism of science and religion is the most mischievous. True science and true religion are twin sisters and the separation of either from the other is sure to prove the death of both. And with that, I'm going to end the slideshow and it is uh, coming up on the time that we would normally need to end, but um, I'd be happy to take one or two questions if there are any. Um, and it, since we um, didn't, aren't gonna really have time for many questions, if you have questions, you can send them to um, uh, uh, Manny Rodriguez at mrodriguez at stbarts.org. And um, he will forward them to me. You can also post questions in the uh, comments section on YouTube or Facebook. And um, we will try to answer them as best we can. So I've got like maybe a minute for questions before we will move on for the day. Hi, Meredith. Hi, Manny. Thank you for that. It's great. Um, we do have a few questions coming in. Um, and one of them is how many other of how many other of the Hudson River School painters were impacted by German thought? Uh, I think a great deal of them. Um, many of them were influenced by by German thought, by German science, and the place to study at that time was Dusseldorf. So they picked up um, a lot of training in Dusseldorf, both artistic and one would expect also um, cultural, philosophical and scientific information as well. Dusseldorf was kind of the hotbed for training for American artists of the 1840s and 50s. Great question. Thank you. Um, we, we have another one. Okay. Uh, says Church's painting included a cross were these kinds of symbols generally a part of other paintings or did they mostly rely on depictions of nature and other ways of sort of evoking God? Another great question. Um, the question about why that cross is there has um, been a question for art historians for a long time. Um, generally speaking, if you find a cross in an American landscape painting, it will be very small and tucked into the landscape um, almost as a, a shrine, but it is not the norm. Church was the one painter who would um, almost surreptitiously sneak a cross or a shape of a cross into his landscape. Sometimes it would take the form of a broken 
mast of a ship or something like that. But, but by and large, um, the symbol of the cross was not often used in landscapes. And one was intended to rely on the contemplation of nature to commune with, with, uh, with the divine. Thank you. Okay. So um, did Darwin have an effect on painting? Well, that's the, that's the big question. Um, if you're painting, painting, painting landscapes to point to God, and you have a certain belief in, 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 um, in how the earth was formed based on the biblical story of creation, then Darwin kind of blew that all up. After the Civil War, um, landscape painting, of course, continued to, done and it continues to be a popular subject today, but the, but the, um, the impetus behind it, of course, is different. Um, and there is, um, there is a different way of looking at the landscape where there isn't this moral or religious component to it. So I think it probably depends on the artist that you're talking about, but I would say yes, in a certain way he did. He had to shift the, he totally shifted the conversation uh, about what landscape painting is about in mid-century, mid-19th century America. Thank you. So um, I th it's an almost 10 to 11. We are going to be starting our 11 a.m. Uh, worship service momentarily. So please stay tuned for that. And before I leave you today, just want to let you know that um, our forum next week will be in celebration of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King's birthday. And our speaker will be the Right Reverend Mark Andrus. Bishop of the Episcopal Diocese of California, who will offer an inside look at King's friendship with the Buddhist monk Thich Nhat Hanh. So we hope you'll join us then and also join us for worship at 11, which is starting in just a few minutes.